Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. I'm Jeremy Spivey. I'm a research analyst here at Repair Shop Websites, and today I'm going to be talking about the most effective ways to market your shop services. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can just type them into the chat box on the right side of your screen, and if they're relevant to most of the people on the webinar, and I know the answer off the top of my head, I'll, I'll cover it after the webinar. And if not, I'll try to get back to you in the next day or two with an answer to your question. So I'm excited to say that most of the information in this presentation will be coming directly from a study we conducted, a participation from over 200 independent repair shops all across America. So we asked them a, a range of questions about marketing techniques, whether they use them, how effective they were for their shop, whether they were planning on increasing or decreasing spending on specific activities going forward. Uh, we're also going to be pulling in some data from some other sources as well. And, and by the end of the webinar, you're going to have a pretty good idea of what marketing efforts other repair shops and other businesses in general are, are finding to be worth the money and effort. So before I dive into the data, I wanted to talk a little bit about the study we conducted. Like, like I mentioned earlier, participants were all independent repair shops based in the U.S. Uh, some were repair shop websites customers, but many of them were not. We invited several thousand shops of all sizes to participate. And uh, of course, repair shops are really busy places. We did get over 200 of them to contribute to the study. So the, the participants have already received the results of the study. And we're also planning on conducting two of these shop studies next year. And if you'd like to receive the results uh, of the study as soon as we complete them, we'd be happy for you to to participate as well, you can just look for an invite in the first half of the year in your, in your email from us. So back to the study, uh, you can see on the slide that the vast majority of the shops that participated classify themselves as general automotive shops. Uh, we had broad representation from shops in cities of all sizes. I've, I've circled the middle here uh, between, um, between 5,000 and, and 300,000 population, but in reality, it was about it was about a third each from uh, cities with less than 20,000, cities with 20 to 100,000, and then cities with, with more than a million people. Uh, in terms of the shop size, most participating shops saw less than 300 cars a month. So uh, before we jumped into what worked and what didn't in this survey, we provided several categories of marketing spending and we asked the shops to rank the categories in terms of most of least spending. So on the screen of the seven categories, and just as an example, if every single shop had ranked a category as their number one biggest expenditure, it would show up as a number one on this chart. Of course, Every shop didn't do that. Different shops spent the most money on different categories. So what we did was we averaged the rankings of all 200 of the shops. And then for each category, a higher rank uh, with, with one representing the highest rank means that, that that activity received more spending. So online search category came in as the highest rank category with a, a 1.94. It was far ahead of any other category, which means that a high percentage of the shops ranked it as their largest marketing expenditure. Uh, second place was emails or social media. That was at a, at a 3.06. And then uh, physical mailings was, was at, at nearly a four. That was third place. So no surprise that online search comes in at the top. Uh, a couple of reasons for this. First, most small shops with a limited budget have a website, even if they don't do any other marketing. Why is that important for, for a repair shop to have a website? Because aside from your physical shop, it's the only place people can look where you really do have total control of your image. It's also relatively inexpensive. A site can be as expensive as you make it, uh, especially if you want custom design or custom written content. But in most cities, a website can be done cheaply and effectively. So. We're obviously biased towards websites. Uh, our, our job here is to provide websites for, for shops that search well. So it's only fair to point out there's another reason that the spend is so high here, and that's search engine marketing, online ads, uh, Google ads, and those are also included in this category. And you know if you've used search engine marketing, the cost of those can add up very quickly. Uh, unlike websites, Every type of shop doesn't necessarily get a great return on investment on all of the money they spend on search engine marketing. Uh, 
Uh, we've actually just recently put together an infographic on that topic on search engine marketing and, and whether it makes sense for your shop. And if you send me a message after the webinar, I'd be happy to forward that infographic along and see if it, if it makes sense for you to spend money on search engine marketing. Uh, so a couple of these other categories, emails and newsletters, uh, social media, those are, those are a bit trickier. They can technically be done for free. All you have to do is log into your email account and, and send out an email or log into your Facebook account and post content. But getting results from social media requires posting consistently and posting content that's fun, that's engaging. And, and people are also looking for happy stories on Facebook. The, the news is so miserable these days that Facebook can be an escape from all of that. So having said all that, hopping on Facebook once a month and posting a coupon isn't going to get you many followers. And it's not going to make the followers that you have very happy. It, if someone follows you on social media, it's because they want to be entertained or informed. And they're willing to accept a small percentage of advertising, maybe 10% or less, but they're not using it as the weekly coupon clipper service. They're using it for, for social media. And email is similar. Most people get over 100 emails a week. A lot of people get over 100 emails a day. If you want them to read your email, it better be one of the better emails that they get. So the question for, for emails and social media, I, I had mentioned that you can do it for free, but do you have anyone at your shop that has time to find fun or informative automotive content and then log on to social media several times a week and post that information? We talk to a lot of shops here. Most shops don't have a person with that kind of time. And that's why people report spending money on emails and social media is because they're outsourcing that to a marketing company that can do it more reliably than the shop can. Um, there can be a great return on this type of work. 60% of Americans use Facebook every day. Uh, half of them have talked with a company directly on Facebook, but you have to be willing to be patient because it can take a long time to build up a follower base. So the last one I wanted to talk about here uh, is the only one that was other one that was ranked in the top three by a large number of shops was was physical mailings like postcards. Uh, many shops think it makes sense to send mailings to customers, and in some cases they're right. Uh, if you send mailings to your loyal customers and remind them that they have a service due or offer them a discount on a service they need, uh, it, it will drive traffic to your shop. But if you're layering the neighborhood with postcards, whether they're customers or not, most shops don't get enough customers to make it worth the effort. And if they do, uh, it's often because they had the cheapest oil change coupon in this week's coupon pack. So not a great way to pick up long-term or high margin customers. Um, speaking of return on investment, let's take a look at the, the ROI numbers for all these categories. The, the category with most people saying they got a good return is the online search category. And, and that's great news because shops are spending the most money on that activity. 60% uh, of the study participants said overall they were very or mostly happy with the return of investment of, of those online search activities. And again, that does include websites and those online ads, those Google ads. Most people are searching online for shops these days, so that's where a lot of leads are coming from. You, you've pretty much got to be there. Uh, emails and social media also fared well. 52% of people reported being happy with the return on those activities. And, and mailings and traditional media did not do well. They were avoided by a large number of shops entirely. You can see 41, 46% of shops didn't use them at all. Uh, and, and the shops that did use them reported they weren't particularly profitable for them. So that leaves the two categories here at the bottom. Um, and, and those are categories with good returns on investment, but they weren't necessarily high spending categories for shops. And those are community and customer programs. So these categories are both around 50% of shops say they get a positive return from those activities. And that's actually a lot better than it looks because there's a sizable number of shops who aren't using them at all. So 
put another way, for every one person that's unhappy with the return from these activities, there are more than two people who are happy with the return. So great result for, for those two. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about each of those and why they're really great places to put money, even if they may not produce enough leads to keep your, your shop overflowing with cars. Those are the only two things that you're doing. So the, the community category, that includes uh, sponsorships, events, charitable giving. One of the big marketing advantages that independent businesses have is that they're a part of the community. And, and the money that they make stays in the community. It benefits employees in the community. So when these businesses contribute to the community in invisible ways, it highlights that fact. Uh, some examples of those types of, of contributions might include sponsoring a little league team or a cancer research run. Uh, if your town has a, a local festival that they run every year, they, the town may need sponsors to help put that on. So these aren't things you have to spend thousands of dollars on for results, especially in, in rural or suburban areas. But when people see that you're involved with a cause they care about, they're going to remember that. And, and when you give back to your community, it lets your customer know that when they do business with you, they're contributing to their community too, indirectly. Um, so that's important. Customer programs also ranked fairly well with around half of all people using it, saying they were, they were happy with the return. So that category includes referral bonuses for when customers refer other customers and loyalty rewards. If you, if you have a kind of loyalty rewards program for customers that come back again and again. Um, so a, a couple of things here, loyal customers and referral customers are generally good customers. They've already heard about your service uh, or they've experienced it directly and they decided to come back to your shop. So compared to the average customer walking into the door for the first time, they're less likely to be price shoppers. They're more likely to trust you. And so it makes some sense to put extra effort into attracting these types of customers. Uh, another point, you can sign up for, for a loyalty program like Bay IQ or Belly uh, and use these programs to administer rewards. It, it'll make your life easier in some ways, but one downside is that you have to pay to even participate in the program. You, you can also administer your own loyalty program. So two major advantages to administering your own program. The first is that if you do, you'll make these programs one of the rare marketing techniques where you don't have to pay anything until you've earned a customer. You don't have to reward a customer for, for loyalty until they show up repeatedly. Uh, you don't have to reward a customer for a referral until the referral actually shows up in your shop and pays for your service. So you might not control how effective the program is, but you can definitely control your return on investment because you decide how much you're willing to pay for each of those customer actions. You decide how much you're willing to pay for a return customer or a customer that spends a certain amount of money or a customer that refers another customer. Uh, and, and you're not going to pay that amount until they actually do that. The other major benefit to, to running your own program is that you can get creative with it. So there are plenty of large businesses that are using loyalty points. You've probably run into these before. They'll give away points that you can trade in for free stuff or coupons. But we've heard some really brilliant marketing ideas from customers that, that are running programs at, at independent shops. So a couple of examples. Uh, pick out your loyal customers, hand write them a note in between visits, and include a couple tickets to a local movie theater, a minor league ball game. You, you'll want to make sure they could use the tickets on multiple days, otherwise they might be busy when the event is happening. But it's, it's a lot more personal than just $10 off or 1,000 points. Uh, another idea, you can find another locally owned business nearby, like maybe a ice cream shop or a pizza parlor and buy some ice cream cones or, or pizza for local customers and send that in letters or hand it out when they check out as a thank you. Uh, it, it helps to emphasize buying local and the other business owner will probably give you a great deal on that stuff to send some business their way and they may send some business your way too. Uh, so neither one of those ideas are, are expensive at all, but 
they seem a lot more thoughtful than a thousand bonus points on a big national program that comes with a you know a card they have to put in their wallet. So uh, back to the return on investment chart. Uh, the I had mentioned earlier that the two categories in the middle in red there, mailings and traditional media, they don't have a lot of fans. Um, unless you really need to get some customers in the door fast, sending out thousands of postcards may not produce the results you'd think. Uh, most of those are probably going to end up in the trash without even being looked at. So big difference between sending out a hundred hand signed postcards to your most loyal customers and sending out 5,000 postcards to addresses where you don't even know whether the person's car is in warranty or if they have a car at all. That's just, that's not going to produce great returns. Uh, and, and the worst performing category was, was traditional media. TV, radio, newspapers, yellow pages, billboards. So here's the bad news for that category. Newspapers are losing readers fast. I'm sure you've read about that. Uh, TV viewership, that's declining. People are moving to Netflix and Hulu, all of these other streaming services. And none of those services really have local ads. And in fact, cable and satellite have lost between seven and 800,000 subscribers for each of the last two quarters. So they're struggling. Radio, terrestrial radio is actually doing okay in terms of listeners, but people have always drowned out the ads when they're listening to the radio or turn the knob. And, and radio spending is actually down 8% since 2006, which is, which is over 40% if you adjust for inflation. It, as far as yellow pages, I don't even, what do you even do with, with yellow pages these days? Um, I have the internet and the smartphone, so I get it every year and just deposit it directly into the recycling bin. Um, Dex and Haibu, both old phone book companies, they've each gone bankrupt multiple times. It's, it's a tough industry to be in. So these all used to be great sources of, of new customers for shops. Uh, people did get their information from local sources, local newspapers, local TV stations. It made a lot of sense to advertise there, but people are mostly getting their information from the internet these days and then repair shops are figuring that out pretty quickly. That's why almost half of the shops in the survey say they don't use any traditional media advertising at all. Uh, and, and even among those that do less than half are happy with the results that they're getting out of it. So the category is fading towards zero. Uh, and honestly, that's a shame because it was a great way to get the word out about your shop. It's just, it's not working as well anymore. Uh, so this is where most shops stand right now. Uh, we asked if they were planning on increasing or decreasing their spend in each of these categories. Um, most shops are using community events, online search, emails, and social media to bring in customers occasionally using mailings, uh, not necessarily satisfied with the results there. Um, so shops are in the next couple of years planning on increasing spending on activities that worked and decreasing spending on the activities that haven't delivered. So that's, that's not particularly surprising. Uh, virtually everyone that's using traditional media still is, is planning on decreasing spending in the next couple of years. Mailings, physical mailings are more of a mixed bag. Some shops are going to increase spending in that, but a slightly per larger percentage are going to decrease spending. Uh, online search is a category with the highest spending, best return on investment, and more shops are planning on increasing spending activities there to bolster their own line, their presence, and any other options. And again, uh, community and customer programs probably have the highest return on investment, but the, the two of them alone can't bring in enough customers for most shops to fill all the bays because it's particularly effective with returning customers, but not so great with, with new customers. So uh, since so many people are using online search, uh, last thing I wanted to do was to give you some advice on how to make the best use of your money when you are looking at a website. And that's, whether you use us for, for web service or not, we do want you to get your money's worth when it comes to websites. And it is way too easy to get a bad break out there when you're getting a site built for your shop. 
So the single biggest piece of advice I have is to pay someone who knows how to attract customers to repair shops. And that's important because it takes a lot of testing and refining to build content that actually searches well for any specific topic. Um, so you want a company that's taken all the time and money to search well for a particular topic and is splitting that cost over hundreds of websites. That would be true whether you ran a repair shop or a pet store or anything. Uh, if you don't have a provider that's that's doing that and splitting the cost over over hundreds of, of businesses, it's either going to cost you a tremendous amount of money to get that content custom written, or you're going to be disappointed with the results that you get. And there's really no shortcut to great content. So there are several providers out there that specialize in repair shops, and I'd recommend that you select one of those. Uh, another major piece of advice I have is to think like your customers when selecting a site and not necessarily like the business owner. So what I mean by that is only give yourself about seven or 10 seconds when you're looking at your site to find the information that a potential customer would be looking for, your location, your services, how to contact you, a map. If you don't see those in the first seven seconds of looking at your site, that's a bad sign. And seven seconds seems pretty short, but what happens is that people pull up five or six sites at once and they'll scan through each of them quickly to decide which one of those businesses they want to call. So uh, if you, if they're not probably not going to look at your website for more than about seven seconds before they decide if you're one of the shops that they're going to give a call to. So many of the best looking sites on the web actually fail that test. They look great, but, they don't necessarily get any results because it's hard to find that information. And unless you're trying to win a design contest, your website's for marketing. So the results matter more than how great it looks. Uh, the, the last thing is don't let anyone tell you that hits or visits matter unless they're really digging into the data to figure out whether a hit actually represents a potential customer. So, Google's web crawlers hit millions of sites every day. There are millions of automated scripts that are visiting sites and, and gathering information like emails and addresses. So those hits, those aren't always people. And even if they are people, they're not necessarily people that, that are anywhere near your shop. They could live halfway across the country. So what really matters in, in, shop, in a website performance is how you're searching in Google, how many phone calls you're getting at your shop, and, and how new customers tell you, tell you that they found your shop. Uh, hits really don't matter. So that's probably the most important piece of advice that I have. Uh, and, and one more, it's, it's not really difficult to explain the basic ways that a web developer uses to make a site search well. It takes a lot of work. Uh, it takes a lot of text, takes a lot of copywriting. Um, it, it takes a lot of, of content to explain to Google and to your customers uh, about your shop. You need links to the outside world. You need people linking back to your site. You need good reviews. But none of that is rocket science. It's, it's not complicated to explain. It just takes a lot of work. So if you run into a website provider, this throwing a bunch of acronyms and tech jargon around and they can't actually explain how they're improving your search rankings, they're probably not talking over your head. They're probably talking over their own head. If, if they can't explain to you how their services will lead to more revenue for your shop in a way that makes sense, avoid them. Uh, so if you follow those four tips, you'll be well on your way to getting a great return on investment on your website. Um, so one more thing before I close out, uh, a little bit about us here, repair shop websites. We've been providing websites for automotive repair shops for the last 14 years. Uh, we have more than 2,100 customers in all 50 states and in Canada. Uh, our focus is on building a web presence that attracts the exact types of businesses you'd like to see, whether that's general automotive, brand specific, specialized repairs. 
Uh, some of the biggest names in the auto industry partner with us. They help shops increase business, uh, including AC Delco, Auto Value, and Parts Plus. And we've never relied on contracts to keep our customers. We rely on customer service. So you can call as much as you'd like or ask for as many changes as you'd like to your site at no added charge. Um, I, I hope all of this information has been helpful for you as you plan a successful marketing strategy for 2019. If you have any questions about anything I've covered, you can contact me using the contact information right here on your screen. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in and I hope you have a great rest of your week.